very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here uh, at the Institute of Advanced Studies. Uh, I'm really happy to have the opportunity to do this in my book. Yes. So I'm happy to have the opportunity to be telling you a bit about some of the work we've been conducted, conducting at the Paragraph Lab. Uh, so for today, I was told to prepare something that would be of interest for people outside of my field of expertise. I'm interested in different domains, researchers from different domains. Uh, so as you said, I come from cognitive science, cognitive psychology, experimental psychology applied to education. And so what I wanted to do today was to try and talk to you a bit about some of our recent findings regarding mathematical thinking, how people uh, think when they try and do mathematics. And to take this opportunity also to tell you a bit more about some of the specificities of uh, psychological methodology, uh, how we can use different kind of methods to try and probe uh, uh, human representations about mathematics and about other things as well. Okay, so don't hesitate to ask me if you have any question at some point. So, is it working? It's not working. Consider the following sentence, all mammals need water. All PhD supervisors need water. Now, if I were to conclude based on this student, based on these sorry, two sentences, that therefore all PhD supervisors are mammals, well, you probably already understood that this sentence is incorrect. This uh, kind of reasoning is incorrect, even though the conclusion here uh, is correct. Uh, it's true that all PhD supervisors are mammals, but it's not something that you can deduce simply from knowing that mammals need water and PhD supervisors need water. But if I were to ask random adults uh, whether this reasoning is valid, uh, whether it follows a lot of logic, well, data shows that two out of three people will think that this is indeed a correct form of reasoning. And it can be surprising but the fact is, because we know that the conclusion of this reasoning is true, we tend to think that the whole reasoning is true. Now, let's consider a different one. If I tell you that all alpacas <laughs> breathe oxygen, all PhD supervisor, supervisors sorry, breathe oxygen, and therefore all PhD supervisors are alpacas. Now, you probably understood that this is the same kind of reasoning that we previously, previously saw, but this time, because the conclusion of, this, of the syllogism is completely uh, invalid, then it's much easier for people to realize that this kind of reasoning is not accurate. In fact, when you ask someone to try and see if this type of reasoning is correct, most people will tell you that this is not a logical conclusion, a logically valid conclusion that you can arrive to. But this idea, although very simple, it's uh, it, it touches something that has to do with human reasoning. When we reason about different things, we have a way to reason about specific things that depend on what we are reasoning about. And it's an idea that's relatively recent in the history of thought, because for a very long time, we thought that humans were rational, that humans were able to engage in a logically valid kind of reasoning. Uh, Aristotle uh, said that humans are rational animals. They are able to engage in logically valid reasoning, and that's actually what differentiates them from other types of animals. Descartes uh, thought that God's gift to man was a reliable intellect, which, if used correctly, was sure to avoid errors in reasoning. And Bull, uh, when he wrote his book uh, about the rules of Boolean algebra, uh, which is a formalism to describe uh, logical relations, well, when he wrote his book, he titled it An Investigation of the Laws of Thought. So this translates the idea that for a long time we thought that human reasoning and logic were the same thing, and that 
people, when engaged in reasoning, were actually engaging in logical activities. And it's only recently that things started to change. But even in 1958, Piaget thought that reasoning is nothing more than the propositional calculus itself. So it's something that changed relatively recently in the history of thought. Now, why did it change? Well, mostly because there was a psychological researcher, who was called Wayson, Wayson, sorry, who did uh, what he called the selection task. He created a task to study how people think about uh, specific things. Mostly, he wanted to try and see if humans were able to understand the uh, logical statement, if P, then Q. Basically, the way he did that was he presented participants with a series of cards. On all of these cards, on one side, there was a number. And on the other side, there was a letter. And what he did was he presented participants with a series of cards, and he asked them, which cards must you turn in order to test the truth of the proposition that if a card shows an even number on one face, then its opposite face has a vowel on it. Basically, the if, then, uh, if, P, then, Q, he wanted to test that. And so he did, if the card uh, has an even number on one side, it has to have a vowel on the other side. And so he presented them with these four cards. So there's a card with a three, a card with an eight, a card with an A, and a card with a D. And he asked participants, try and see which cards you absolutely need to uh, turn over to be able to understand if this rule is respected in all of these cards. Okay? And what happened is that most participants thought, okay, there's a three on this card, so we don't need to actually turn over this card. But here there's an eight, so we want to see if there's a vowel on the other side. So people said we need to turn over the, three, the eight. The thing is, they also said we need to turn over the A because the A is a vowel, and they, <coughs> and they thought that if it has a vowel, it has to have an even number on the other side. Whereas it's the other way around. If you have an even number, you need to see if it has a vowel, but not the other way around. So most people answer these two cards. The fact is, this answer is incorrect. You don't need to actually turn over the card uh, that has the A, because if on the other side uh, it's not an even number, it also works. The rule is not broken. Okay? You do have to turn over the 8, but you also need to turn over the T, because if on the other side of the D there's an even number, then you have a problem, and the rule is not respected. So this is a correct answer, the 8 and the D, and most people actually fail. Uh, only 10% of participants actually manage to select the two correct cards when asked to uh, do this task. So it shows us that humans don't actually reason based on the rules of logic, at least not all of the time. And so to go a bit further, uh, other people try to, yeah, just uh, so yeah, about that. Uh, if P then Q is not the same as if Q then P. That's basically the gist of uh, this experiment. And so other people try to go a bit further regarding this issue and to try and see if people might be better at reasoning about these kind of things in a specific context. Because here, these rules, they're a bit arbitrary. They're, they're not really, they don't have any meaning to them. And so Cosmides and Tubi, they proposed a different kind of experiment in which what they did was they said, imagine you are a policeman entering into a bar and you have to check that no person drinking alcohol is uh, below 18 years old. So basically, if P then Q is this time uh, said in the way of if you are drinking alcohol, then you must be over 18. So if alcohol, then major. And he presented to them four different, they presented to them four different cards. One card that says this person is 16 years old, but we don't know what they're drinking. The other card that says this person is 25 years old and we don't know what they're drinking. 
this person is drinking beer, but we don't know how old they are. And this person is drinking soda, and we don't know how old they are either. And they asked, on which, which people uh, must you go to and ask either for their, their ID or for what they're drinking, okay? So this is a different kind of situation because you know, you understand the meaning of the rule and you know that someone who's below 18 shouldn't be drinking alcohol. And so when participants, when the, sorry, when the experimenters uh, asked this question in this, in this way, actually the performance were much better than they were uh, in the other task. Okay, so here the correct answer is to say that I have to check the 16 years old and I also have to check the person drinking beer, not the person drinking soda because we don't care about their age and not the person uh, who's 25 years old because we don't care what they're drinking, okay? So despite the fact that adults tend to struggle to identify the, to understand the specific logic of relations, their difficulties can be lifted by changing simply the semantic context content of the situation by presenting the situation in a different light. Now, if human reasoning does not follow the laws of logic, then what rules does it follow? That's the big question we want to understand. So if we are not reasoning according to logic, not all the time at least, then what is it that actually influences the way we think about the different situations we meet? And so in order to study that without one way to look at it would be to look at mathematics because, well, mathematics, they're kind of seen as this land of abstraction. You know, there's, there are some more uh, concrete uh, disciplines and then there are mathematics that are supposed to be the peak of abstraction where you only manipulate abstract ideas. And so we wanted to try and see how that would uh, basically translate into people's ability to engage in mathematical reasoning. Are people actually able to engage in a fully abstract mathematical reasoning, or is our ability to engage in this type of reasoning depending on the context in which we are? When we think about mathematics, we think about abstract ideas, we don't think about a specific context. And we wanted to try and challenge that and see how it goes. So basically, if you think about a simple operation, you have six apples, you remove two apples, then you have four apples. You know that the, should I? Okay. Uh, you know that the mathematical principle behind the situation is six minus two equals four. Six minus two equals four. And you know that this simple principle can be applied to different situations. If you take, for example, six hours minus two hours, it equals four hours. Okay, it doesn't matter whether you are counting apples or whether you are counting hours, it's always the same. And so when we talk about mathematical ideas and we, when in psychology we uh, reason about the type of problem solving that uh, people engage in, well, we should usually consider that there's on one side the surface of situations, so all the contextual clues that you can have. And on the other side, there's a structure. So the deep mathematical structure behind the situation. Okay, the deeper principles. And so what we wanted to try and show was that actually the kind of surface features that you have in the situation will have an impact on the way you think about these situations to the extent that it might even lead you to sometimes make mistakes on mathematical problems. And so the reason why we thought about that was because there was an experiment that was conducted by Bassock, Chase, and Martin in 1998, <coughs> where what they did was they asked participants to create problems. They told them, okay, you have a set of elements, two sets of elements, and you have to create a problem, a math problem with it. For instance, you have apples and oranges. They told them, imagine you have six apples, two oranges, you have to create a math problem for a fifth grader, for example. And so, what they realized was that when you tell that to participants, what most participants will be like, okay, you have six apples, two ranges. You put them together, how many fruits you have in total. Okay, so because apples and oranges are kind of the same thing, you put them together and then you add it up. And then it's a simple problem that only needs an addition to be solved. Okay, but 
what happens if instead of apples and oranges, you tell them to create a problem with flowers and vases? Well, participants know that flowers and vases are not really the same thing. There is a semantic relation between the two. So they won't say just, oh, we have six flowers, we have two vases, we put them together, how many objects do we have in total? It doesn't make sense. Instead, what they will say is, you have six flowers, you have two vases, you put the flowers inside the vase, how many flowers do you have in each vase? And so just because they have specific knowledge about the, the asymmetrical relationship between flowers and vases, then they knew that the flowers are supposed to go inside the vase and they thought of a different kind of operation, a different kind of problem that can be solved here with a division. So simply depending on the elements or the context we have, we think of different types of operations. Uh, we can either think of a problem that has an additive structure or of a problem that has a multiplicative structure that can be solved using a division. And why is it important? If it's just that, if it's just that we tend to think about a specific operation instead of another, then it's not really a big deal. Uh, but the thing is, they, after they did an experiment where they looked at mathematical textbooks, textbooks used with children, learning how to count, learning how to do additions and divisions. And what they saw when they looked at these problems, at these uh, textbooks, sorry, is that in mathematical textbooks, the uh, kind of examples that are given to learn about additions, they always think that are symmetric, symmetrical in the semantic relationships. So for instance, apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. And when you learn about divisions, it's always with things that make sense. So for example, flowers and vases. But then what happens exactly when you have to make a division, to do a division between apples and oranges, or when you have to add flowers and vases? Well, the, the students are not really ready to do that because they didn't learn about that. And it's not enough to just say, okay, but they will understand the deeper principle and they will just be able to use it in any situation. What we think is it might actually have an impact on the way we think about these situations and on the way uh, children and then later adults will be able to solve specific problems involving different types of elements. And that's basically what we wanted to step. So yeah. And so if we go back to this idea of the surface uh, features and structural features, what we wanted to show the, the, the work that we conducted was really focused on the idea that we want to highlight specific types of relationships in the surface features that may lead to different kinds of structures being perceived, constructed by participants. And that will then impact the way they think about these different situations. So if we take, for example, the apples that we mentioned earlier and the hours that we mentioned earlier as well. Well, what we think is that these two types of entities they actually evoke different sides of numbers. Because when we think about apples, we don't think about them the same way we think about ours. In fact, we tried to see if there was not something uh, in this situation that would either evoke the cardinality of the numbers that are present or their ordinality. So if you don't know about these notions and I'm no mathematicians. I know we have mathematicians here, so correct me if I'm saying. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but the idea behind cardinality is that uh, the cardinality is a number, basically, the number of elements within a set. And if you consider a set that has a specific number of elements, it doesn't really matter in which order you are counting the different elements within the set. Okay, it doesn't matter if you start there or if you start there. At the end of the, of the day, sorry, it's there are six elements in this set. Okay, so this idea that we perceive the total number of things in a set, that's what we call the cardinality of numbers. 
And on the other side, when we mention ordinality, we talk about the order between the different numbers. So for instance, if you have an ordered sequence, then you have a first element in the sequence, and a second element, and a third element. And you can't just make them up. You can't just go from the first to the fourth and then to the second. Okay, you have to do it in a specific order, and that's what we mentioned when we talk about ordinality. And what we believe is that what we wanted to try and show was that the way we think about specific entities in the world actually highlights either the cardinality of situations or the ordinality. So basically, we believe that some situations will be more cardinal and other situations that we tend to be perceived as more ordinal situations. So to give you an example uh, of what we mean by that, if you consider three dictionaries, okay, you have three different dictionaries, all of them have a different weight. Well, if you're thinking about these different dictionaries, you might think how you want to pile them up on a shelf or line them on a shelf. And it doesn't really matter in which order you are adding the dictionaries if you just want to know how much uh, of weight does the shelf need to hold, okay? It doesn't really matter. You can group them in any kind of way you want. It's always the same. There's no specific orders between these dictionaries. On the other hand, if you consider, for example, the different ages of life, well, you know that it's they have an ontological order. Okay, you know that uh, teenagehood comes after childhood and before adulthood, and you know that you can easily compare different ages on the same axis. That would be a timeline, and because we tend to think about ages using timelines, then we believe that it might influence the perception of the ordinality in this type of situations. So, due to this difference between cardinal situations and ordinal situations, we believe that participants may create cardinal representations and ordinal representations based on the situation they are in, based on the type of elements that are present in the situations. And so we thought, how can we try and study these mental representations? Because it's one thing to say, probably, but people will think about a cardinal representation or will create a nominal representation. It's another thing to actually be able to measure it. You know, in the history of psychology, uh, it used to be about uh, self report, introspection, and these kind of things. And we cannot rely on that because it's not the rigorous approach that we want to have here. So what we decided to do was to try and create mathematical problems that would let us um, probe, study, investigate these representations by using different kinds of experimental settings. And so we designed a whole set of experiments that were meant to look at the same thing, the same phenomenon, the difference between the perception of cardinality and the perception of ordinality, but through different lenses, using different kind of approaches. And so I'm going to present to you some of them. And uh, yeah, we'll see, uh, we'll see how it goes. So based on this difference between cardinality and ordinality, we created what we call cardinal problems and ordinal problems. What we wanted to do was create problems that all share the same mathematical structure. So this is a schematic representation of the mathematical structure of the problems we presented. The idea was that we wanted to create problems that could be used with different type of cover stories, you know, different type of problem statements with the same mathematical structure, and that could also be used with children, third graders, fifth graders. So it had to be simple enough to be able to do that, but also to it had to be problems that could be represented differently and that these different representations would lead to different kinds of strategies. So basically what we did um, was we created two types of problems. I'm gonna read you one of these problems. So this is what we call a cardinal problem. It's a problem about weight, about the weights of different dictionaries. And 
So I'm going to present to you the different sentences of the problem. And below, it's the kind of the kind of representation that we believe people will abstract in their mind, will construct in their mind when they think about this type of problem. So if I tell you that Malik grabs a Russian dictionary weighing five kilograms, he's also carrying a Spanish dictionary. In total, he is carrying 14 kilograms of books. Now, Emily, she takes Malik, Malik's Spanish dictionary and a German dictionary. The German dictionary, it weighs two kilograms less than the Russian dictionary. How many kilograms of books is Emily carrying? I'll give you some time to think about it. I'm trying to solve it. And as you do, please try and be mindful of the way you found the solution, what type of operations you used. Can we have a show of hands of people who think they might have found the solution? No. Uh, Sorry? Yeah. At, the at the beginning of the um, part, the first sentence with the German uh, money graphs, then German dictionary, uh, we have the Hmm. Why of the German dictionary? There is two sentences. Yes. Then, um, after we have those two books <clears throat> and the two doors, with the third sentences, mm -hmm. we have the Spanish white. Then we have all the operation to manipulate it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if I understand correctly, what you did was so we know the weight of the Russian dictionary and we know how many kilograms of book books Malik is carrying. So we can deduce the weight of the Spanish dictionary. And then we know the difference between the Russian dictionary and the German dictionary. So we can find the weight of the German dictionary. So most people will actually do that. And because they will do these steps, then they will add this weight of the Spanish dictionary and the German dictionary. And that will let them to have the total weight of books that Emily is carrying. So it's a three-step operations, basically three operations that people use. So that's what most people do on this type of problems. So if we remove the mention of Russian, Spanish, and German, we go to these uh, abstract structure that we came from, you know, with different parts, so part one, part two, part three, and two embedded sets. Okay. And so when you have this type of structure, we believe that people we use these three steps strategy. So three different uh, operations that led to the uh, calculation of the results. So if you if you replace it by the numbers, if you replace it by the numbers, then we can see that you can find a solution using these three operations. But it's not the only way to solve this problem. There's actually another way that is quicker, that is only a one step uh, operation, but it's harder to find. It's, we believe it's more difficult to find if you have this type of representation, because in this type of representation, you perceive the different sets and you want to calculate the value of each element within the set in order to uh, have the value of the total, because you have a cardinal representation of the situation. Now I'm going to present to you another problem that shows, us, that shows the same mathematical structure, but with a different kind of cover story. So same thing. So, so it's very good. Yeah. It's really interesting. Why? Why is this different? Okay, we, we consider this things that are there. Mm -hmm. But uh, at school, we remember the theory of some assemblies. It's a logic of the theory of some assemblies, standard mathematics. Yes. Here, if you have this, mm -hmm. it is nicely represented. Yes. In uh, ensemble, in set theory, this is set theory. What do you think, Raymond? Uh, That's the set theory. Is here. Yeah. So, if you have this interpretation, it is corresponding to this set theory. You have seen this is the set theory logic. Logic, we have now all of our, our passing mathematics. Yes. So, so you're saying it's easy. Yes. <laughs> yes. I agree with you. It's easy. It's just that it's three steps. 
but but uh, not or can only if you see this image ah, uh, yes. you can also uh, imagine that the one step within but this is from a set theory logic is yes immediately. yeah of course but not everyone actually sees this image it's kind of a mental representation that we construct and not everyone really because the set theory does not be specific uh, given anymore in mathematics <laughs> 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 yeah this is I uh, we got in the college, in the, in the college, what is college, uh, not college, in the, what is the uh, 12 or uh, 20 years old, we learned this uh, at school, at least in my, in my time, uh, we, did, we did the set theory. A little later, I did also. Yes, uh, yes. Some, uh, some, yes. So how many people uh, sort of use a different strategy where you don't need the type of programs? Or <clears throat> okay, so I'll, I'll present the results after, yeah, okay. but yeah. basically, depending on the people or children or adults or experts, uh, they make more, more or less of them use the three-step strategy, but the three-step strategy is the one that's <laughs> most used in these problems. By far. Uh, yeah. So that's on a cardinal problem, and then a different problem on which it should be easier to perceive the other alternative strategy that exists. So if I say that Tom attended final cl classes for five years, he started the classes when he was a child, he stopped attending the classes at the age of 14. Now Lucy, she started attending piano classes at the same age as Tom. <laughs> and she attended the classes for two years less yeah. than Tom. Now, how old was Lucy when she stopped attending the classes? I'll give you a moment to think about that. Yeah. Basically, what happens in this type of situation, what we believe happens, is that people will understand that since Tom and Lucy started at the same age, and that uh, Lucy uh, attended the classes for two years less than Tom, then she stopped attending the classes when she was two years younger than he was. So we know that she stopped at the age of 14, yeah. and we know there's a difference of two, yeah. so we know she stops at 12. Yeah. Sorry, but when I read the first two sentences, it's not clear that it said when he was five, but it said when he was a child, that could be yeah. two, three, four, Nine. Nine. Uh, no, no, we don't know when he started. Mm -hmm. We don't know when he started, but we know that he attended the piano for four years, years. or five years. Right. And we know <laughs> that um, they started they the classes see. at the same age. So this <laughs> value, the starting age, we don't actually know it. We can calculate it. We can do 14 minus 5 equals, and, and then we find it, but it's not necessary to find the solution. Because you know she stopped at 14 and they started at the so same why time. Do you need that sentence then? Like well, that the idea was to have the exact same number of sentences than on the other situation so that it could be compared the two. So we present the same values in the same order. And in the different situation, we also had a, a sentence that provided no additional numerical so information. Okay, so if I go back. He's also carrying, he's also carrying the Spanish dictionary. Yeah. You know, we know there's another part, but we don't know what it's its value. Mm -hmm. Now, this sentence is telling us the same thing. It started at some point. We don't know when exactly, but we can calculate it if we want. But because we believe people will construct an ordinal representation of this situation, then they will find the solution in one step instead of using the three step algorithm. The both both algorithms are correct for both problems, mm -hmm. but we believe that this type of situation will lead to this type of algorithm. Okay, so if we replace it by the value that gives us 14 minus 2 equals 12. And that's basically what's at the heart of the different experiments we did, these kind of problems that we played around with and use in different kinds of situations. So basically, we have the same mathematical structure, and this mathematical structure we implement it with different type of quantities. So we used three types of quantities that we believe elicited a cardinal inquiry. We used prices problems. So the same as weight problems. You, know, you have different items in your cart, 
and you're going to pay them. It doesn't matter in which order you are paying the, the items. Okay, the weights columns, as with the dictionaries, and the collections columns. We have a different sets of elements that are uh, compared. You have uh, a collection of apples and a collection of, or of oranges, for example. We believe that when you use, we use this kind of quantities, then participants will create this kind of cardinal encoding. But if we use the same mathematical structure and use ordinal quantities this time, such as durations, like we saw, or heights, if you do problems with different heights that are being compared, or even elevator problems, where you have different floors and the elevator goes from one floor to another, it's a problem that's easy to represent along an axis. And so we believe that when we use these kind of quantities, then participants will construct this ordinal encoding of the situation that will lead them to think differently about the situation. So the first question we asked was, do these variables, these quantities that we've selected, do they spontaneously evoke different kind of encodings, different kind of representations? Because that was our idea, but we needed to test it. Yes. What's the intuition that like uh, time is different than money in terms of its likelihood to be uh, cardinal versus its ordinal? Like, to me, I wouldn't have had that intuition uh, at the beginning. Okay, you mean where does the intuition come from? Yeah. Um, Behind those stories that you just let out. Okay, we, we spent some time trying to think about what kind of quantities would elicit an ordinal encoding and what this is a cardinal encoding. And some of them were obvious, like durations, for example. You know that you tend to think with a timeline and things that you tend to group together with, but okay, they are the collections of elements. And that's where we started. But then we thought, okay, if you add the price of different items or the weight of different items, it's also kind of the same thing. And we had other quantities in mind, for example, temperature. We thought about temperature, like it moves along an axis. But in the temperature problems, you always needed a time reference, like the temperature was, and then now it's a different temperature. And it added a different kind of quantity. So it was time and temperature at the same time. So we decided to discard it. And we arrived with these uh, six different uh, quantities. But it's just uh, trying to think about them. But that's not enough. That's why we tested them. Yeah, because I think um, with the weights and the books, it's not so much the weights, it's more the labels of the different books that would be, because they're not really out of transitive. Um, yeah, I agree. You, you can actually label a book by saying this book has this weight. And yeah. there are also ways to have the weights be more ordinalized in a different kind of situation. And that's actually something we did uh, in another experiment. So you're going ahead. But in another experiment, we tried to, for example, make <coughs> times more cardinal. Yeah. So for instance, uh, to paint this room, I have six hours. To paint yeah. this other room, I have four hours. And then I add the rooms. And we saw that people tended to use more the three-step strategy than they would on other ordinal problems. But they still use it much more, much less often than on truly cardinal problems. So it, it's not a, it's not a perfect difference. It's more of a gradient of yeah. more ordinal, more cardinal, and you can play with it. Yeah. So yeah, we have to start somewhere. Yeah, the interesting drama. Just, yeah, I think to me it's more like um, how categorical the mm -hmm. how many categories are involved. And yeah, but basically what it boils down to is that people tend to categorize these type of things. Tend to tend to itemize this type of quantities, and they more often think of weights as assigned to different elements, and they think of time as assigned to different elements. And so, we're not saying that there's an ontological cardinality in weights. We're saying that the way people use them, they cardinalize it compared to other quantities. It's like how fungible or sorry, how fungible are the associated uh, items or mechanisms? Like a Russian book and a yeah. German book, those feel more different or something than if you said two Russian books. Uh, yeah, some of the labels we use is just to make sure that the problems had the same length. And so we needed the same level of details in the different problems because we wanted it to be 
able to compare them. So we have a bunch of constraints that we have to use. And that makes it that sometimes the sentences might seem a bit weird, like you're mentioning that you're starting when you were a child, but it's not very relevant. But um, yeah, there are some constraints that, uh, and that's why we went with Russian book and uh, German book. We could have gone with other things. And we did different types of problems. We were never used only one. Sure. Yeah. I present to you some of them. So the first thing we did was we asked participants to sort the problems because we wanted to see how people would spontaneously categorize all of these problems. So what we did was we asked 85 adults, so not children, adults, uh, to, we presented them with 12 problems. So all the problems share the same solution principle, okay? There was six cardinal problems, so two collection problems, two weight problems, two price problems, and there was six ordinal problems, two high problems, two duration problems, two elevated problems. We presented them with all of these problems printed on separate cards. And we gave them all the cards and we told them, okay, try and categorize your problems using as many categories as you want, just as many as you deem fit. And our hypothesis was that when presented with the problems, participants will spontaneously categorize them based on the ordinal or cardinal properties, meaning that they would put together problems that elicit the same kind of representation. And so that's basically what our hypothesis was. So in order to analyze this data, we performed, uh, we computed a co-occurrence matrix that we used to compute a hierarchical clustering analysis that basically gives us, uh, so the different problems are here. And you see that they are grouped together based, the, the first criteria for grouping by participants was, for example, if you have two duration problems, most of the time they were grouped together, okay, which makes sense and two flow problems, the same. But also we have these higher order categories. And here we see that the duration problems were more often grouped together with the, four, with the elevated problems and the height problems than they were with the collection problem, the weight problem and price problems. So basically, even though they did different things from one participant to another, what appeared when we analyzed all of the data was that there was this big difference between the six cardinal problems and the six ordinal problems, which led us to think, okay, the kind of problems we decided to pick actually work at some level because they kind of uh, elicit the same kind of mental representation that's uh, leading the sorting task. Okay, so that's what we started by doing. And then we thought, okay, but what if we ask us? Oh, sorry. What were the AU and DP numbers? Yes, that was a way to um, to evaluate to, to calculate p values for the hierarchical clustering uh, with a special analysis. And that's four years ago, and I don't remember exactly. <laughs> Sorry, but uh, yeah, law on the paper. And so what we did next was we asked participants to directly compare the problems. And so we presented uh, 142 adults with the same problems. Uh, but what we did, so six cardinal problems, six ordinal problems. But what we did was we presented them uh, a pair of problems. So one cardinal problem, one ordinal problem, or two, card or two cardinal problems, or two ordinal problems. And we asked them explicitly can these two problems be solved following the same principle? We wanted to see if they could go beyond this initial spontaneous representation and actually perceive that the problems were the same and could be solved. The same way. So our hypothesis was that when you have a cardinal problem as a source problem, then participants will, of course, uh, see the similarity with other uh, collection problems, but also with all of the cardinal problems, and that they wouldn't see the uh, similarity with ordinal problems. And we believe that when you have an ordinal source problem, then you perceive the similarity with other ordinal problems, but not with uh, cardinal uh, target problems. So that was our hypothesis, and that's basically what we observed. So if you look at the, the number of correct ident identification of the similarity between the two problems, you see that for the 
when the cardinal source pro when the source problem was cardinal and the target problem was cardinal, we were at about 80% of identification of the two problems being the same. And if the two problems were ordinal, it was also a high number. But if one of the problem was a cardinal problem and the other was an ordinal problem, then there was this difference. And it was only around 60% of participants who actually managed to identify this, um, this similarity between the two types of problems in both cases. So we had this nice interaction between the two situations. So basically what it tells us is that even if you tell people to compare the two problems explicitly and to try and see if they can be solved the same way, that it actually doesn't work in some cases and they have more trouble to find that the two, that one ordinal problem and one cardinal problem share the same solution than they do to understand that two cardinal problems or two ordinal problems share the same solution. And have Wi-Fi Don't pay attention. All right. <laughs> and it's something that we also replicated in a multiple choice uh, situation where we have one source problem and six target problems, and they have to select all the problems that can be solved the same. And we basically observe the same results in this situation. Okay, so now we've looked at the kind of representation participants have, but it doesn't really matter if it doesn't have an impact on our performance in problem solving, in actual problem solving. So what we did was we tried to study. Uh, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Actually. Okay, uh, thank you for this question. Um, so regarding the gender of the participants, we didn't find any effects of gender on the participants' performance. Uh, now regarding the learning preferences, uh, actually the idea that we have multiple intelligences and all that we have different learning styles, it has been shown that it's a neuro myth. It's a myth in education that tends to be really spread, but it doesn't have any actual scientific basis. So we didn't uh, use this. We didn't try and test it in, uh, in this situation because it, it doesn't really have any, any uh, basis. Along the same vein, can you, can you see if this difference survives high level of education or certain sort of occupational? Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you for the transition. Uh, it's not the same. There's the next one, but it's the one after. Okay. We did uh, try it yeah. with uh, expert mathematicians. So we'll come to that. Okay, so first we wanted to see if it has an impact on actual solving. So, what we did was this time we tried with children and with adults because we wanted to test if it also works with children and we wanted also to have results uh, with adults and it's easier to have results with adults so we had uh, 59 fifth graders 52 adults and we present them we presented them with the same problems but we had two tasks first we asked them to solve the problem using as few operations as possible and writing down every operation they used so if they were able to find a one step solution they should try and use it. We wanted to test if they were able to do that. And also, we asked them to make a drawing of the situation depicted in the problem. We told them, try and make a drawing that would e explain the problem to someone who hasn't read it and who's trying to find a solution. Mm -hmm. So they were asked to solve the problem and to uh, make a drawing. The idea was that the drawing Sorry. of the participant. In, in this order, or? Um, they, no, the, before... the two at the same time. Okay. They, had, uh, they had the space for the drawing and the space for the solution. So yeah, it's a good question. They, they could just do two at the same time. And, and so we wanted to see if the drawings actually featured more cardinal features or rather ordinal features. So what we did was we asked uh, two people who knew nothing of the experiment to evaluate all of the drawings and to see if there were some cardinal features. So what we considered to be cardinal features were collection of elements, many elements put together, uh, groupings or sets of elements, embedded sets, or uh, value assignations. When you say this value equals uh, this drawing equals this value, 
All of that we consider to be cardinal features of the drawings, and for each feature we added plus one to the cardinality score that could go up to four, depending on the number of features that were present in the drawing. And we also calculated an ordinal uh, feature score. The ordinal feature score, uh, the, 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 the two independent graders of the, of the drawings, had to see if the drawings had axes, if they had graduations, if they had compared axes, or if they had intervals and shows. And we wanted to see if the drawings were more cardinal features or ordinal features. Basically, do they look like that or do they look like that? And we had the idea that cardinal problems lead to cardinal drawings and ordinal problems. Ordinal drawings. Sorry. For, yes. for ordinal features, uh, there is no proposal with process or because process is both cardinal mixed with ordinal. Uh, no. What do you mean process? process um, when you think you draw an element, then you might uh, ah, narrow or mm -hmm. next step. In a, in next step in okay, uh, I see what you mean. Um, the arrows were kind of embedded in the axis situation. Uh, it was up to the two graders to evaluate whether it was an axis or not. So it was them, they discussed together and they uh, went, were in agreement with all of that. We didn't uh, specifically add something for the arrows. That could be an idea that's for an arrow that is not an axis. Uh, we didn't at the time. We only had this. But that's an interesting idea. So if we look at the results of the drawing analysis, we see that among children on cardinal problems, so the cardinal scores, right? <laughs> what degree of agreement? Is there is there is okay. Uh, it, it was really high. I don't remember the exact number. I think it was like 97 at first. And then they talked together, they, they talked with each other, and they went on agreement on 100% of the cases. They were on agreement on 100% of the cases. We calculated the kappa uh, for initial agreement, and I don't have it right here. Sorry. But uh, I have, it's on the, the article. <laughs> So if we look at cardinal problems uh, for children, they had a higher cardinal score than an ordinality score. Whereas ordinal problems uh, had a higher ordinality score than the cardinal uh, score, cardinality score. Basically, which means that on cardinal problems, the uh, drawings look like that, and on ordinal problems, the drawings look more like that. So the scores weren't very high because some of the children were gave uh, could really little detail, but it was still significant, significant the, the difference. And if we look at adults, then the scores were higher, but it was the same thing. Cardinal problems, they drew sets, embedded sets, collection of elements, and so on. And on ordinal problems, they drew axes, basically. So we had this difference uh, among adults, among children, of the different kind of drawings they will make. And that we think is a nice indicator of the kind of mental representation they constructed of the problems. Now we've looked at the representation and want to see what kind of strategies actually used to solve the problems. So on the cardinal problems, children found the one-step algorithm on, so this is a successful use of the one-step algorithm. Okay, when they found a solution using only one, uh, so one uh, iteration. On cardinal problems, only in 8% of the cases, whereas on ordinal problems, they found it on 39% of the cases. Then we also looked at when they use the three-step algorithm, and it appears that on ordinal problems, they used it much less frequently than on cardinal problems. They still use it to some extent, but there was also a significant difference between the two, uh, between cardinal problems and ordinal problems in the use of the three-step algorithm. Now the rest of them, you know, it was errors or access rest of uh, answer because all these problems aren't that easy for fifth graders. They're a bit complicated to pass. Now we looked at adults, and among adults, um, there was also a difference uh, between cardinal problems and ordinal problems in the use of the one-step algorithm. They only used it on 25% of the cardinal problems, whereas they used it on 46% of the ordinal problems. And uh, on the other hand, they use the three-step algorithm more on ordinal on cardinal problems than they did on ordinal problems. 
in this situation. The rest were errors or no answers. Um, sorry? Here is not, I think it's not the AIDS entering in the States, but the education level. Ah, it might be education level. Um, the thing is, we replicated these results in many different settings, and we always find the same thing. So the, the general level may vary, but there's always this preference for uh, one step for original and uh, three step for cardinal level. And it's a, a bit more. So in short, regarding these experiments, uh, children and adults alike tend to encode problems according to the daily life knowledge about the elements mentioned in the problem statements. You know, the knowledge that the uh, books can go on a shelf and that durations can be represented along an axis. And here, both groups find it harder to use a one step algorithm on cardinal problems than on ordinal problems. And it's also a result that we replicated among third graders. So it was a simplified version of the problem because there was too many mistakes already here, but we did a simplified version and it also worked with third graders. Now, we don't have that much time. So maybe I'm gonna skip the next experiment and go to the experts one because I think it's a one that. So I was asked about the expertise of participants and can experts overcome these effects and focus on the problem's mathematical structure. So obviously, if we give participants an unlimited amount of time and there are experts, they will find the one-step solution. But we wanted to see if it was harder to find it than to find the three-step solution on uh, cardinal problems. So what we did was we took this problem that had this mathematical structure where you have to find the value of all to remember. And so you remember this problem, they have two different algorithms that can be used to find it, a three-step algorithm and a one-step algorithm. So the values that we have at the beginning of the problem statements are these. So we have the value of whole one, the value of part one, and the value of the difference. It makes it possible to do the three-step algorithm or to do the one-step algorithm. But then what we did was we removed one of the values from the problem. So we removed the value of part one. And when you don't have the value of part one, you actually can't use the three-step algorithm. It doesn't work anymore. So the only way to find a solution is to use a one-step algorithm. So basically, you have only two numerical values in the problem, and you only need to subtract one from the other. And we wanted to see our participants able to perceive that this is the only solution and to use this solution on cardinal problems. So basically, if you look at the Kind of problem we saw earlier, we have these information and we removed here the value of the Russian dictionary. So we don't know the value of the Russian dictionary, we don't know the value of the Spanish dictionary. We only know that uh, Malik is uh, carrying 14 kilograms of books and that the German dictionary weighs two kilograms less than the Russian dictionary. So to find a solution, you have to understand that both Malik and uh, Emily uh, share the same Spanish dictionary, and that's what that's uh, what's next what makes it possible, sorry, to do 14 minus two equals two, equals 12, sorry, and find the solution. So we did that with 25 math experts. So there were uh, French students who had uh, successfully passed the entrance uh, exam of the École Normale Supérieure uh, en Mathématiques. So there were really high level students who are used to thinking about abstract ideas. And we presented them with these modified problems. Basically, what we did was they had six target problems. So three cardinal problems and three ordinal, and three, three, cardinal, three ordinal problems, and also six distractor problems that had no solution. So we, we removed another value of the problems and they just couldn't find a solution. And we presented these problems to them with the solution. So we gave them the problem and we wrote down, can this problem be solved by doing 14 minus two equals 12? So we presented them with the solution and we asked them, does it work? So they just had to check if the solution actually worked to solve the problems. And to make it a bit harder, because of course they might be able to find the solution, we asked them to try and answer as fast as possible. So they were told that the priority number one was to answer correctly, but that they had to do it as fast as possible. So it was done on the computer and they just had to answer. And so, 
we did that. And when you look at the results on original problems, they did correctly identify the solution on 95% of the problems. But on cardinal problems, they only found the, they only identified that uh, 14 minus 2 equals 12 makes it possible to solve the problems on 76% of the cases. So you see that even among, ma among mathematical experts who are used to thinking about abstract ideas, there was still this difference between these two types of problems, even though the <coughs> kind of simple problems with weighing different kind of dictionaries. And we also looked at the rest of science and we saw that when participants actually managed to find the solution in cardinal problems. So we only looked at the response time to correctly solve problems. But when they did find a solution to a cardinal problem, we thought it was because they had to recode the representation to create a new representation instead of the first one that comes to mind. And we thought if they do so, it will take them more time. And so that's what we can see here, that the cardinal uh, response time was higher than the original response time for this experiment. So basically, despite the ability to engage in highly abstract reasoning, even experts from the team that uh, one in four cardinal problems uh, was unsolvable. The increase in response time suggests that finding a solution requires a costly decoding process. So the idea is that you, come, you have one initial representation, you have to create a new representation. And so this is a result that we also replicated with lay adults. We also replicated with secondary teachers, not, uh, notably math teachers. And uh, we also replicated it with no time constraint. When you don't ask people to reply as fast as possible, not with experts, but with adults. And we also replicated it uh, by not giving the solution, but just asking them, does this problem have a solution? What is the solution of this problem? And still the same kind of results were observed. Uh, all the times. So I think I'm out of time, so I'm going to go to the So, I had other experiments that we can talk about, so I questions if you want. But um, so we did the same thing with uh, problem recall when we asked participants to try and recall the problems. And we actually saw that they recall sentences that were not in the problems, but that could be inferred from one of the two uh, kind of representation that they created. So inferences that they drew only in one case and not on the other. And we also did some experiments with eye tracking to see that spots can focus on different kind of um, numerical values, depending on the type of the problem. And that also when they find a solution to a cardinal problem, it requires more uh, cognitive effort as seen by the pupil dilation when they try and solve these problems. So, as a in summary, uh, despite the abstract nature of mathematics, it appears that non mathematical daily life knowledge interferes with the mathematical representation humans construct, construct. These representational differences limit transfer and generalization, and so they're important, notably in schools. Overcoming this semantic incongruence when you have this difference between the knowledge that comes from the life and the mathematical knowledge, overcoming this, uh, this incongruence uh, implies a costly decoding process, even among experts. So we believe those effects need to be taken into account in educational interventions and school curriculum. And basically, we want to try and continue this kind of work to show that human reason differently depending on the context in which the encoding uh, the reasoning actually takes place. So I just wanted to thank my collaborators who were my PhD supervisors when most of this work was uh, conducted, Emmanuel Sander and John Hansel. And of course, to thank all of you for your attention and your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Ipolit, for this inspiring, very interesting uh, talk. And I have to apologize because when introducing you, I forgot to say that you are um, also uh, an, uh, a young academician mm -hmm. because in the year we have um, a launch in this, this year, the Young Leaders Academy, there are three young talent that are promising uh, researchers for, from each uh, Utopia University um, uh, in this uh, new academy. And so uh, we are very happy that uh, Ipolit is one of the three 
Teresia Academy Sciences. Uh, I apologize.